2 Timothy chapter 4. <coughs> and we're going to read from verse 1 down to verse 10. And the theme really of the message this morning is keep the faith and don't give up. Keep the faith and don't give up. Verse 1. Paul says to Timothy, he says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. I suppose in, these, in this chapter, chapter 4, the theme really that we have from Paul to Timothy is keep the faith and don't give up. Notice what it says here in verse 7. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And he's encouraging um, young Timothy here to keep the faith. Keep it. Keep hold of it. You know, it says here um, in verse 6, it says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. And when Paul was speaking this, this he wasn't speaking about some holiday that he was going on, some vacation. He wasn't even talking about because he was coming to the end of his life, because he was an old man. Um, that he may have to go into hospital and, you know, he, he, he's very near to his departure. No. He's speaking here about some execution. He's speaking here about the end of his life. His death. And he's saying that, uh, verse 6, that my departure is at hand. And you know, Paul here is exhorting Timothy and is exhorting Christians to keep the faith. And don't give up. Why was Paul so concerned about this here in this chapter? Well, if you look down here in verse 10, we see a man named Demas. And it seems like Demas had given up on the faith. It says, for Demas hath forsaken me. And then it says, having loved this present world. And he's departed unto Thessalonica. And we see here that um, Paul is warning here of not giving up the faith. Demas had become what the scripture mentions as a shipwreck. Okay, if we just turn back um, to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse... Uh, 19 and we see again that the apostle paul here is encouraging timothy to hold on to the faith verse 19 he says holding faith and a good conscience and then he says which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck and you see here paul has had an experience of shipwrecks we know that he had an experience on the sea, but here he's speaking about spiritual shipwrecks. I don't know if you've um, ever seen a shipwreck, um, 
a few months ago uh, at Bethel we were having a holiday Bible club and we were looking at lessons uh, upon the Titanic and uh, we were looking um, at uh, the importance really of um, obeying warnings and uh, seeing the dangers ahead okay um, but eventually this Titanic ship after they had obeyed warnings that there were icebergs in the area just carried on they even um, increased the speed okay on, the, on their maiden voyage and bang hit this iceberg and this biggest ship in the world okay sank it was about 13 miles to the bottom of the uh, Atlantic Ocean and, and it's there today it's still there and I don't know if you've seen um, clips on YouTube but they have videos that you can see they, they have this robot that went down with a light and it's gone around all the wreck and you can see the wreck what it looks like and it's an absolute mess it looks nothing like that ship when it was sailing upon the ocean beautiful um, it was in pieces and it was spread about spread out in different places and you know this reminds us really of a, a spiritual shipwreck as well you know often Christians end up in pieces and they end up all over the place and in bits because they've not held on to the faith they've not kept the faith um, and Paul had plenty of experience with this and Demas here is one of these shipwrecks Demas is one here where it says he forsook Paul you know if we just turn to um, a couple of scriptures we'll see that Demas was a co-laborer with the Apostle Paul just turn to uh, Colossians, uh, Colossians chapter 4 just turn to the left Colossians chapter 4 and uh, we see a couple of times how uh, Demas had been a co-labourer um, with the Apostle Paul. Colossians 4 and verse 14. He was with the, another Apostle, the Apostle Luke. And it says, Luke, the beloved physician and Demas, greet you. Okay, so Paul here, he's sending uh, greetings from Luke and from Demas um, to this um, fellowship, these Christians. Um, at Coloss. We see again in uh, Philemon, if you turn to the book of Hebrews, and um, the book just before Hebrews, it's not uh, the easiest book to find in the Bible, it's only one chapter, but uh, Philemon, and uh, verse 24, and um, well, just turn to verse 23, we read there, salutes the, speaking about Christians that are saluting um, these Christians. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Verse 24, Marcus, Aristarchus, and then he says, Demas, Lucas, my fellow labourers. Okay, so we see here that uh, this man, if it's the same man, I, I believe it possibly, it possibly is, that Demas was a, a one who had fellowship with other believers, other Christians. He had fellowship with the Apostle Paul. He had fellowship with Luke, okay? The one who wrote parts of the Bible. But we see here that he had forsaken Paul and he'd loved this present world, okay? Um, what happened in verse 10? Why did he forsake the faith? Why do professing Christians, why do Christians, so-called Christians, those that profess the faith, maybe for years, right. why do they seem to just drop away? Why do they seem to just give up and you don't see them at church again? It's incredible. I mean, some of the people that I can think of right now, I, I could name some people, I'm not going to, but... The person that um, led me to the faith, this is like 26 years ago, I watched his life and I could see that there was something different about this young man and his wife. Not only did he have a part in leading me to the Lord, but he also had a part of leading other young men who used to ride motorbikes, led them to the Lord as well. 
And you know, for 25 years, he's been nowhere with the Lord. And I just, I can't understand it. Maybe one day I, I will get a, a better understanding of, of what happened. Uh, and I remember that when I, when I uh, returned from uh, having a short time on the mission field, I returned back um, and I tried to get in touch with him and I, I met him. And I can tell you, it was like, he was like a different man. He was like a different person. And he didn't want to know me. Um, and I'd only done good to him. I'd never fallen out with him, never said a bad word to him. Um, and his wife said to me that, um, you know, that he's just, um, he's backslidden. But I could see that he'd, he'd lost his love for the Lord. And I can't understand it. I know men who have been pastors. And I know, you know, they've led um, Bible uh, prayer, prayer meetings with other Christians inside their homes. And, uh, you know, they've, they've taught the Bible. Um, and then suddenly something's happened in the church. And they've left their wives and they've run off with some young girl from a youth group. And today they're married together the wife was over there and they're over there still going to a church which I don't know what they're preaching there but I can't understand that you know uh, you know I know I know men who, who have been in, uh, in, in, in Bethel Baptist Church back in, in Ward End um, even when we, we first came, came to the church many many years ago and um, they just got some teaching from America yeah. and it just led them away in error and we're going to look at that this morning but I just found it incredible but you know Paul here is not joking he's not messing about when he's saying that we need to keep the faith he's warning us as Christians because there are many things out there and in here where we can be led astray if we're not careful. There are many people that come out with teachings that if we're not careful, we don't get into the scriptures, which we're going to look at this morning. We're not careful. We can be led away. Um, I w I'd just like us to touch on four four reasons there could be many more but four reasons why those that seem to profess the faith just seem to disappear drop off drop away and we don't see them anymore and the first reason is is because it's possible that there were never Christians in the first place you know not everything that looks Christian is Christian it can have a veneer okay well, let's just have a look at verses 3 and verse 4 because Paul warns here of um, people that are not going to endure sound doctrine. He says, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And this is what happened years ago in, uh, at Bethel. Um, where a teaching had come in and this you know he, he started to believe that um, that you needed to do something in order for you to be saved it's not enough for you just to believe the gospel and to repent but there were steps that you had to take in order for you to reach salvation okay and this teaching has led um, this man and his family away from the Lord and um, you know And he says in verse 4, he says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. This is the danger. And shall be turned unto fables, to lies. Okay. Let's just, um, let's just turn to Matthew chapter 7. Because I'd just like to sh um, stress this point really. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 13, he speaks about the parable of the tares and the wheat. And... Um, you know, he says that, um, that, that, that there are going to be those with God's people 
the tares are going to be amongst the wheat. Uh, and I've never seen a, a tear in real life, but I've been told that you can't tell the difference very much between the tear and the wheat. They look very close, they look very similar together. Okay? And it's like that within church. There are people who come into fellowship, into the fellowships, and they may look Christian. Okay? Um, let's just have a look at what the Lord Jesus Christ says, because Jesus says that he's going to judge at his, at his appearing and his kingdom. There's a time coming where Jesus Christ is going to separate the tares from the wheat. He says in verse 21, he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These are not Jehovah's Witnesses. These are not Muslims this morning. These are people who have called Jesus Lord. Okay? These are people who have had close fellowship with God's people. These are people who have named the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be a shock one day for some people. Many churchgoers on that day, when they stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ, they will get the shock of their lives. And they will think back. And they will think all the times that they have maybe been in church, all the times that they have dressed nicely, all the times that they have been with amongst God's people, and Jesus will declare unto them, I never knew you. That's quite sober, isn't it? You know? I believe that on that day that there are going to be many ministers. There are going to be many men and women who have stood behind pulpits thinking that they have been God's people and that they have been pastoring and that they've been leading God's people. But their lives... I've done something di very different. Many that have been wearing dog collars, maybe. Many even that have been wearing ties. Been standing behind the pulpit. You know, last night I was um, just looking at um, the Southern Baptist Church in America. And you know, um, I don't know a great deal, a lot, uh, a lot about the uh, Southern Baptists, but I know that there have been men that have preached the gospel um, and have loved the Lord. But do you know that at this time, that they're actually ordaining sodomites to the ministry. And they're still getting hundreds, and they're still getting thousands within the congregations. And it's incredible. But people are being deceived by these false teachers, these false ministers. And one day they will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will say... Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. It's going on here in this land today. Paul is warning us as Christians. He says, keep the faith. Keep it. You know, there are many people in church today. There may be some here this morning. I don't know. Maybe you've been coming here for many years. Maybe you have heard the preaching of God's word. And maybe you think, maybe because maybe your sister or your brother or your parent um, is a Christian, maybe you think that this makes you a Christian. This makes you right with God. The Bible says there's only one way to get into heaven. Jesus says, ye must be born again. Ye must be born again of the Holy Spirit. It's not enough for your parent to be a Christian. Or for you just to hear the Bible stories. The Bible says repent and believe the gospel. The Bible says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He died for your sins. But have you made him your saviour? If not, why not today? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today is a day of grace. And God wants to forgive We've heard this morning about how the Lord took and bore our punishment. 
He did it for you. And he did it for me because he loves us. Never Christians in the first place. I wonder, have you been born again? Let's just turn back to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And just notice in verse 1, because Paul warns us here that there is a day of judgment coming. He says in verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who, what's the next word? Shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ could appear very, very soon. His, his, his return is imminent. I, I believe that with all my heart. I do. I believe from scripture that we can, we can see it very clearly. But when he comes, he's going to judge at his appearing and his kingdom. And um, the Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die, but after the judgment. There's a day coming, the day of reckoning. Let's not fool ourselves or anybody else any longer. Let's make it sure today that we are saved, that we've been born again. We've had our sins forgiven. And we're not going to end up on that day where the Lord Jesus Christ will say to me, depart. We want to hear him say, come. That's what we want to hear. Come thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest, into thy, into thy rest. Wonderful. So, first reason why it is that some seem to profess the faith and they seem to just drop away. Maybe they were never Christians in the first place. The second reason could be is because of love for this present world. Alright, let's just have a look at that in verse 10. This is what Demas' problem was. Verse 10 Paul says, for Demas, having forsaken, hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He's not speaking here about the creation. He's not speaking here about the uh, beauty that we see around us, having loved this present world. No, he's speaking about the world's system. We're going to have a look at that in a minute from 1 John verse 2, but I'd just like you to see... The difference between Demas and Paul. Let's just have a look here at what um, the love that Paul had in verse, um, verse 8. And we read here, Paul says to Timothy, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. See, he's got his eyes and his thoughts fixed upon the future upon a day that's coming okay and he's saying and not to me only but unto all them unto all you who are Christians okay but unto all them also that love his appearing we notice here the difference between Demas who loved this present world and a man who loved the Lord's appearance this is what Paul's priorities were Paul's love was for the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he had his, his eyes and his mind fixed upon. It was the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And being in that place with Jesus. That's what that verse 8 is speaking about. The future. Oh, it's, it's sad, isn't it? To think about Demas. What is on offer? But he chose to forsake that and to have his heart fixed upon this present world. Let's just turn to 1 John chapter 2. Let's just have a look at what um, Paul is meaning here about this present world. The love that a man can have for this world. What, what does it mean to love this world? What is it in this world that men um, love? Well, verse 15 John says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. Now, he's giving us a description here about what Paul is speaking about, about having a love for this present world. He says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the, the flesh loves the world. The flesh loves sin. The Bible says that there is pleasure in sin. 
for a season. He says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And again, we see here the two differences. Having a love for this present world, and having a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Having a love for the Father. Um, let's just, um, if you just turn to Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> and Paul nails it here really. What the flesh loves. What this world loves to offer us here this morning. And um, you know, it's not hard to find. You know, if, all, if we've all got a TV in our home, you know, if we're not careful, we can all be susceptible to some of these things, in having an influence upon us. I'm not saying get rid of your TV, but I'm basically saying be careful with it, okay? Because this world appeals to the flesh, and your flesh will render to the, to the things of this world if we're not careful. We need to be on our guard. Notice what he says, Paul, in verse 19. This is what the flesh loves. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest. These are open. These are clear. Which are these? Adultery. That's the first one. You know, there was a time when, um, and it says here, fornication. There was a time where, when marriage was, it was sacred. There was a time when a man and a woman would not come together in, the, in a union sexually until they got married. There'd be a time where a man and a woman were not even living in the same home until they got married. But today, those standards don't seem to be there anymore. Sure. And it's not a strange thing anymore for a man and a woman just to live together and to have sex together and, to, and, and to, the Bible calls it fornication. That's what fornication is. It's sex before marriage. And this is happening. Okay. Um, but more and more I believe. It's becoming more and more acceptable in our society. Standards are dropping. We know that. We know what the, the, the laws that are coming into this land. We know that they're ordaining sodomy. Um, and it's becoming rife in this country. You know in Liverpool. The first time that we went uh, together as a couple, well, the second time we've been, the day that we went, they, had, they actually had this pride, you know, this what they call gay pride event, okay? And uh, the, some of the things that I saw, I just, I was amazed. I was sadly amazed. Do you know that, and, and there are some of the streets in Liverpool, in the city centre, where on the, um, on the signs, they have rainbows. And we looked out of our bedroom uh, window right into the city and we could see cafes with, um, with flags hanging out of them, with the rainbow flag. Okay, And these places are actually designated for sodomites to go to. It's like an invitation. Okay, The place where I collect, uh, where I collect containers sometimes, Okay, I've noticed that they also they have a, a rainbow flag stuck up in one of the containers there. This is the day and age that we're living in. It's incredible. And you know, young people today, they're being brainwashed. That's right. And they're coming, becoming, I don't know if to say desensitised, because maybe a lot of them have never been sensitised in the first place That's against sure. it. Sure. You know? But for me, you know, seeing these things, it's incredible. We've moved on. A lot in these last years but you know these things here appeal to the flesh and it says adultery fornication uncleanness lasciviousness idolatry witchcraft hatred variance emulations wrath strife seditions heresies envyings murders drunkenness revelings and such like of which I tell you before as I have also told you in time past just take note of this now, what Paul says. He says that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Don't be deceived. If you're living a life like this, if you are continuing in this lifestyle and it's not affecting you and it's not even bothering you and if you're continuing in it and uh, you're just ignoring it, it's probably it's a sign that you've never been saved in the first place. And Jesus, uh, Paul says here by the inspiration of scripture that you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you continue in this way, you need to repent. But these are the things that entice our flesh. These are the things of this world. The things that this world offers us. We need to be careful because each one of us here, we can fall. We can fall into adultery. We can fall into some of these works of the flesh that Paul is speaking about. And we need to guard, we need to hold on to the faith by God's grace. We need his strength. But we need to have that resistance in him to these things of the flesh. These are the things that Demas had chosen rather than choosing the, 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 the way of the Lord. You know, he forsook the fellowshipping with Paul. The Bible says that we need to fellowship all the more as you see the day approach. It's approaching. And you know, we need to fellowship more. I think it's Hebrews 10, 25. Forsake not the, fellow, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And you know, there is something in fellowship that keeps us close to the Lord. There is. It's an encouragement. And Paul here is trying to encourage Christians to keep the faith and not to give up like Demas. Um, I will do this morning. What are your priorities in your Christian life? Um, let's just have a look back in verse 7 of our reading. Because Paul says, I have fought the good fight. He says, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And this was Paul's priority in his life. Was to finish well. And to keep the faith. And you know that's my desire. That I pray for from the Lord. That he will help me to finish well. And he will help me to keep the faith right up until the end. I don't know when the Lord's coming back. But I believe it's soon. But even if it's not. I pray that God will give me his grace. And give me a desire in my heart to keep the faith. Right up until the end. And I hope that that's the same with each one of us here this morning. Let's not be one of, of, of these. That forsake the faith. And go off into the world again. There's nothing out there for us anymore. There's nothing there. It's like a dog, the Bible says, going back to his vomit. Let's not go back there. Let's hold on to that faith. Let's get our priorities Right, let's finish well, let's keep the faith and let's look forward to what's ahead. Because we've got great things ahead, friends, this morning, dear Christians. We've got a wonderful inheritance with the Lord. And it's not far away. So we see, first of all, never Christians in the first place. Secondly, a love for this world. And thirdly, we see, I believe... Why a lot of Christians just seem to give up is because of a lack of patience. Notice what Paul says here in verse 5. He says to Timothy, he says, but watch thou in all things. And then he says, endure afflictions. And Paul here is exhorting Timothy to be patient. And that's not easy sometimes. I'm not the most patient person around. My wife will tell you that. No problem. Um, and if something goes wrong, I can easily just lose it. Um, and I can go down for a short time. I thank God that it is just a short time. But the Lord brings me back, as we're going to see here. But um, Paul here is saying that we need patience. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And God will allow us. God will give that to us. Um, lack of patience. Watch and endure. I wonder this morning, do you give up when things don't go right? Do you give up when discouragement comes? It's going to come sooner or later. 
one way or another. It may come from out there or it may even come from within here. But what are you going to do with that discouragement? Are you going to let that affect you that you're just going to give up the faith? And just pack it all in and say, right, it's easier just not to do this anymore. Or are you going to keep on walking with the Lord, keeping the faith? It may be that you may look around you, you may see in the church, you may see low numbers. You might think, what's the point of any more, you know? You may get opposition because of your faith. People might be ridiculing you. I don't know. But these things are going to happen in our life. Paul says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution of some sort. It's going to come. Um, if this is life, if, if this is earth, where we're living right now, it's going to come. If we're Christians. But what are we going to do with it? How did Paul react with some of these things? Did Paul, did he receive discouragements? Let's just have a look at verse 14 of our chapter this morning. Because he sees not just Demas had forsaken him, but he says that Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Verse 15, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. There are going to be people that are just going to withstand what you say in the Lord. The stand that you take for the Lord. People are going to... Um, greatly we stand us sometimes. Verse 16, he says, at my first answer, he says, no man, was, uh, no man stood with me. They all departed from him, just like they did with the Lord Jesus. And then he says, but all men forsook me. I pray God that, he, that it may not be laid to their charge. You see here that Paul didn't let bitterness right. get a hold of him. Right. Because bitterness defiles. Right. And if we're not careful... It can defile many people around us. And we need to be careful with discouragements and bitterness. And we need to just take it to the Lord and let him deal with it. Help, ask him to help us with it. Okay? But Paul, he knew what it was all about to get discouraged. But how did Paul deal with it? Well, let's just see verse 17. He says, notwithstanding, he says, the Lord stood with me. Jesus, the Bible says... That he will never leave us nor forsake us. He will not. He's promised that he will be there with us in these times. And he says the Lord stood with me. He doesn't say demons stood with me. Or you know he's saying the Lord stood with me. And he says and strengthened me. That by me the preaching might be fully known. You see he was able to continue in his ministry. And he was strengthened because he was strengthened by the Lord. And if you're discouraged here this morning, if you're in a place where you're thinking of giving up, look, there's strength with the Lord. Take it to the Lord in all thy ways, and he shall direct thy paths. Amen? Amen. Wonderful. Let's just turn to James chapter 1. James 1. And uh, let's not be surprised that these hard trials are going to come to us and I believe that the Lord allows them to come for a reason and uh, James says in verse 1 James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad he's speaking to Christians believers greeting he says my brethren count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations why would that be why would you joy because of temptations because of trials and he says in verse 3 Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit, but it's not just going to come just like that. You know, I don't know if anyone in here has been to a gym, or you, you, know, you, you want to get fit. But, you know, the only way that it's going to happen, the only way that that heart is going to get better, is if it's strengthened, and if it's tried and tested by exercise. Yes, we could eat well, but... Exercise is important for our bodies. And the more that we exercise, the stronger that we're going to get. And it's the same with faith. Our faith needs to be tested. And it needs to be tried. And I believe that the Lord brings these trials into our lives for a reason. And we need to see these things that happen to us 
as a plan of God. Lord, how am I going to deal with this problem? Why are you bringing this into my life? What are you trying to speak to me about? How am I going to deal with it? And the Lord is, is trying to work his, his... He's trying to conform us to the image of Christ. And he wants to test our faith and he wants it to be tried. Isn't that what happened to Abraham when he took Isaac up to Mount Moriah? It was a test for Abraham. And he's, he wants to test us. And some of these things that come into our lives are like a test. And we're to let patience have its uh, perfect work. Verse 4. But let patience have a perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And you see, God has a plan in all these things that he brings into our lives. Sometimes we can't understand why he would let such things happen. Even bereavements into our lives but you know he wants to work through these times through these discouragements and he wants to strengthen our faith and he wants us to rely upon him to be strengthened in him um, that's what Paul happened with Paul I could turn to Romans 8 I'm not going to right now for, for time but you know here again we, 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 uh, we read you know Paul speak speaks about these um, these trials and uh, temptations that, that, that come upon us and uh, God has foreordained some of these things to happen to us and he's predestined these things and it's all because he wants to work in us and he wants us to conform us in verse 29 to the image of Christ and it's not just going to happen while we're sat back while we're sitting back with our legs crossed and just lying back He's going to bring things into our lives. But he wants us to trust him. And we can have the victory. The Bible says that sin shall not have dominion over you. We have God's spirit. Wonderful. God wants to conform you. So we see, firstly, maybe these people that have professed Christianity, have walked in the way for a while like these tears possible first of all that they were never Christians in the first place secondly maybe they were Christians but because of a love for this world that they've just dropped away it may be through a lack of patience just not being able to hold on um, and, and to watch and to endure um, but God is able to help us in these times thoughtfully and very briefly it could be because we've been led away by error Let's just turn back to 2 Timothy. There is, Tim, uh, in Timothy, and uh, throughout some of the, the epistles of Paul, he warns many times for us to beware um, of error. He says in verse 3, he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, things that feel good to the, to the flesh, things that feel, feel good, but they may not particularly be good for us. He says, But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. They sort of listen to the things that they want to hear. In verse 4 he says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be, and they shall be turned unto fables. You see, they're going in one direction, in the truth, and then all of a sudden they hear something that sounds good to an engineer feels good maybe to the flesh and they turn away from the truth and they'll turn to the fables they'll pick up a book and they'll start reading it they'll start getting led away by false brethren and all of a sudden they find themselves just led away by error it can happen I've seen it even in my own 26 years of being a Christian you know when I first became a Christian Back in Blackpool, there was a young, uh, a young man who decided to start um, a home group in his, in his house for Christians, okay? And uh, this hadn't been spoken to, um, to the pastor at all. He just thought that I would set up a meeting and, uh, you know, whoever wants to come, just let him come. And, um, you know, one of the first teachings that I heard as a Christian was that when we become believers, that we no longer sin. We have a new nature now. The old nature is gone, 
Hence we no longer sin. We no longer can sin. We're perfect. And anybody who says that we do sin is just trying to take you back um, to the law. They're trying to take you back to error, to the past. Um, let's just have a look at what John says, shall we? I was listening to a recording last night coming up the motorway of um, Brother Colin. And um, he was speaking about First John. And um, you were talking about the council of... Apostolic Council. Apost Apostolic Council, that was it. Uh, part one it was. And he was speaking about um, what we're just going to look at right now in chapter one. <clears throat> and uh, John says, he's speaking to the Christians, he says that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So it is possible that we can say that we have no sin. But we're deceiving ourselves. And he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And this was the teaching in this home group, that we were no longer able to sin. It's an error. And I'm glad that the Lord showed me at an early start in my Christianity that this was an error. Uh, there are other things, other teachings that have come um, as I've been a Christian. Um, I spoke about that young, uh, about that family in our church at Bethel when we first joined that um, had listened to this teaching from the States and it just led them astray. And uh, they no longer fellowship in God's house anymore. And uh, it can happen. And you know, Pastor Curtis, you know, we've often spoken about this. And, it, you know, he can't understand how this has happened to a man who was once um, in the fellowship, doing things in the house of God. But all of a sudden, error creeps in and they go out. And uh, it happens. And Paul is telling us that we need to beware. Beware. Okay. Um, Bible version issue. Now, there may be someone here this morning. There may be some listening on the recording. And they may say, look, stop going on about this Bible version issue will you because we've had enough of it it's not going away don't keep bringing it up but I believe that this is one of the most important errors of our age and it has been since 1881 and you know if we get led away by error Where are we going to end up? And I believe that there is error in these modern Bibles. And if we're going to get error about doctrine, then we're going to get error in our theology. And we're going to have error in our walk. And we need to have a Bible where there is no error. And I believe that there is only one in the English Bible. And I've got it in my hands this morning. And it's the authorised version. I've read it for 26 years almost. I've never found an error in it, but it's found plenty of errors in me. Found plenty of things that I don't understand. Amen. Plenty of teachings. And maybe I never will understand them all until we get to... I'm sure I won't, until we all get to, uh, to, to the glory. Um, but I'm confident that this book is without error. I really am. And I can recommend it to any one of you here this morning, or anybody listening... For your Christian walk, get a book, get a Bible that is without error. Um, Paul says, watch thou in all things. We need to get to know this book. It's not enough just to know that we've got the right book. And it's not enough just to know the right things. But the Bible says that we need to apply them. We need to hide them in our hearts. Let's just turn to one last scripture, Psalm 119 and verse 11. And this is a guard against error and against us falling away. And verse 11, David the psalmist says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. And let that be our uh, encouragement here this morning. Let us hide his word in our hearts, that we might not sin against him.
this will keep us somebody once said I think that the Bible will either what is it keep us from it uh, either the Bible will keep us from sin or sin will keep us from the Bible that's right that's right and it's so true but let's hide let's hide this word let's hide it in our hearts let's not fool around let's not play around with Christianity as if it's some easy thing you know the devil is a roaring lion and he wants to devour us but thank God this morning that we have a book that can protect us we have a God that can keep us and he will keep us right up until the end look just like he did with the Apostle Paul let's have that confidence this morning okay and let's have that resilience that we're going to keep the faith and we're not going to give up let's have a word of prayer dear Lord we just thank you this morning for these few um, simple teachings Lord from this chapter and um, Lord if there's anybody here in this room that has never become a Christian they may have been to church many times but Lord they've never confessed Jesus Christ as their saviour we pray that today will be that day that they will trust you and Lord we do pray that by your grace and your mercy that you will keep us Lord through this Christian life we don't know how long that we have but Lord we pray that you'll keep us every day keep us in that faith and Lord we do pray for those um, Christians that maybe we know around us maybe we are praying for right now who have just seemed to have fallen away dropped off we do pray for them Lord we pray for your mercy to be upon them mm. we can name some of them here this morning maybe some of them other people don't know but we know about them and you do and we pray that you'll help them dear Lord not to give up the faith help them to keep the faith and not give up and we pray Lord that by your strength by your mercy help them we pray just like you've helped us in times past you've strengthened us Lord and you've brought us back to yourself bring our brothers and sisters back to yourself as well we pray in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Amen.